Ownership is deeply human. The first thing people owned were collectibles, from beads to shells to animal teeth. Our ancestors loved to collect things for self-expression and for identity. It's not a surprise then that collectibles evolved into the first forms of money. In the absence of a central bank or a government saying what is and isn't legal tender, social consensus form around objects that everybody could agree were easy to exchange, but difficult to fake. In a sense, collectibles became portable, physical manifestations of human capital as value. And in so doing, they catalyzed one of the greatest inventions of humanity, trade. In the thousands of years that followed the invention of money, humans created countless things to own, from the dirt we stand on to an infinite variety of processed goods. But starting in earnest with the printing press and accelerating with the advent of photography, movies, video games, we started packaging up even more esoteric things, like knowledge, emotions, and other kinds of experiences to buy, sell, trade, and share with each other. This synergy between ownership and commerce continued full speed until the birth of the internet. Digital capture and storage were absolutely boons for the traditional systems of ownership and trade because they helped us create more and more stuff to sell through the same channels. But digital distribution was a threat because I can take the same MP3 that I own and share it with millions of people at zero cost. Digital media does not follow the same rules as physical objects, at least not until recently. But we still send money to each other online. We still watch movies on Netflix. We buy music on iTunes. How do we do that? Well, the truth is we are forced to rely on systems that are heavily locked down, each one of them a walled castle closed off from everything else. The money actually rarely moves. The movies are all being rented, and the music is just a license to the real thing. We have generations of people, billions worldwide, who think of themselves as owners, but are in fact renters. The record of your rights to each kind of content, the digital equivalent of the library card, is stored on a small handful of computers owned by a small handful of for-profit institutions. It is impossible for you, as the user, to take something that you own and have paid for from one kingdom to the next without permission from the rulers. This starts sounding a lot more like feudalism or serfdom than true ownership. Ten years ago, almost to this day, Satoshi Nakamoto started writing the foundation for a new kind of digital system. Satoshi saw that digital goods needed the same guarantees of permanence and of openness that mirrored the physical world. Digital goods need to be truly owned. He recognized that if we baked in these guarantees at the level of the asset itself, we could build a completely open financial system on top. As the author William Gibson used to say, the future is already here. It is not evenly distributed yet. Just this week, someone moved $190 million of Bitcoin for just 10 cents. Try doing that with your local bank. Now, Bitcoin's ownership guarantees stem from a complex system known as proof of work or crypto mining, essentially by forcing computers to solve complex mathematical puzzles before creating each Bitcoin. Satoshi ensured that no one could fake a Bitcoin's creation. And so just like those shells and beads that served as organic forms of money accepted only by social consensus, each Bitcoin's existence is proof of the work that went into creating it. And it's now forming the basis for a new social consensus. But when you set aside the complexity of the technology, forget about all that, and think of the result of blockchain as simply a way for computers that don't know and don't trust each other to agree on a shared state, a shared vision of the world, the possibilities open up. Now, where Bitcoin was the first real digital asset, we asked ourselves, what else could you build on the concept of a shared truth, a shared version of the present and of the past? 
What else could you build on a system of rules that are as permanent and as trustworthy as the laws of physics? What if instead of creating digital assets that served as money, we could bring back the idea of collectibles as personal, unique markers of identity and self-expression? Given that these things are digital, why can't we program them to do things? When my team and I set about exploring this question, we were struck by the fact that even though thousands of digital assets existed, they all shared one characteristic. They were all fungible. In technical terms, this means they were interchangeable. Just like a dollar bill, it doesn't matter which dollar bill you have, it only matters how many. The same is true of Bitcoin, the same is true of many other commodities. But it is not true of many of the things we own and we love in our lives. Our homes, our art, our collectibles, our progress in video games, the things we own and have an emotional attachment to are actually all non-fungible. But until now, they could not be represented in a cryptographic way. So my team and I started developing an open standard, anybody can use it, for a new kind of digital asset, one that had the same ownership and permanence guarantees of Bitcoin, but one that was personalizable, one that was unique. We call them non-fungible tokens, NFTs or NFTs for short, and we created a game to demonstrate their potential. This being the internet, we decided to pay homage to cats. And in December of last year, released a really deceptively simple game called CryptoKitties. It may sound silly to say, but CryptoKitties is to this day the most used application on the blockchain other than cryptocurrency trading. Each CryptoKitty is a unique digital art form, a collectible bundle of code with a family history and a genetic makeup. The vast majority of our kitties, now over a million, were created by people like you. And because they're digital assets, nobody can change them or take them away, even us. We believe that as players, we will soon come to expect and demand this level of service from all of our digital products, starting with games and expanding from there. But the most interesting thing here is between the lines. What we get excited about is not the fact that we created programmable assets or put cats on the blockchain. We get excited about the fact that we put the programs themselves on the blockchain. The rules of the game, the genetic code of the cats, the breeding algorithms, everything you need to create a crypto kitty is committed onto the blockchain in a way we can't change or ever take back. What this effectively means is our players have full transparency and true ownership, not only of the assets they hold, but of the underlying experiences that they want to access. Blockchain makes the software as real and permanent as anything physical. For the first time in an online world, we can count on a service to be permanent, to outlast its creators, both the individuals and the institutions. This permanence and this openness has an incredible impact. Online services for the first time can be built to interlock and build upon each other without taking the risk of incompatibility in the future. This is the way we typically think of physical products, like plugs and outlets, cars and highways. In our case, this benefit has caused dozens of products, over 50 at this count, based on top of CryptoKitties, built for our users by completely third-party developers who know they're not taking a risk building on top of our foundation. This is, of course, awesome for us, but it's awesome, first and foremost, for our players. My favorite analogy for thinking of this in the global context is Lego sets. If there's one thought I leave you with, it's this. Blockchain is creating a world of digital assets and open source software that is real and permanent as anything physical and built to interoperate like Lego sets. Now, don't get me wrong, the barriers to adoption are incredibly high. Speed, scalability, user experience, and cost will have to change dramatically before any of you will consider using these tools in your daily lives. But if you squint, something absolutely incredible is starting to happen. For the first time, we have both the reason and the ability to tear down the feudal castles that control our online experiences. For the first time, 
we can transition to true digital freedom, where identity, self-expression, and ownership is back where it belongs, in your hands. Thank you.